Welcome back to Kevin Pollock's chat show for the very last episode. Oh my. Ten years. Where the hell did time go? Ten years, you two were in your twenties. Oh, I was in I my know. 50s. I just, I just oh that. no. <laughs> sure. Sam Levine and Jamie Foxx, everybody! Oh. Thank you. We're coming to you live from the Dynasty Typewriter Theater in Hollywood, California. Please go to DynastyTypewriter.com for all the calendar dates. They have extraordinary shows here. You will not believe when you see the calendar. Uh, if you're in the Hollywood area and want to see some, some great comedy, be it sketch, be it improv, be it stand-up comedy, everything in the comedy genre is available on this very stage. Um, this place uh, is, was built in the 20s, this theater. Uh, it is currently haunted. Uh, 13 people were killed. In the uh, between the 30s and the 40s, mostly. Yep. Um, <laughs> and wow, that of, really chilled the room. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I should point out that none of that's true. Right. Also, uh, spoiler alert, and I hate to be the guy. Uh, ghosts, not real. No, not a thing. <laughs> Turns out we've done the math and the yep. science. We've looked into it. A couple of good people have looked into it. Yeah. Not a thing. Turns out Still the movie Ghostbusters was fiction. Yes, that's my understanding. Uh, welcome to the very last episode. Uh, I I'm, can't believe that the uh, the ten years is has come and gone. We have some some clips uh, from a few people who uh, are past guests who wanted to say congratulations. But first, I want to go out to to you two, who have been the uh, kicks in the sides and the side kicks. Mm -hmm. Jamie, you ran the uh, chat room live as we were streaming live for almost nine plus years. Uh, certainly almost nine yes, years. Yes, but we went to audio only maybe like two years ago, so I ran no, it. For, no, uh, just, no a was, oh, just a year. Oh, just a year? So I ran it for, all right, I ran it, it for nine years. It seems longer. Uh, Any, <laughs> if I learned anything, it's to have a thick skin. From <laughs> running the chat <laughs> from room. From running the chat room. They are yeah. not kind, and they do not like women. <laughs> <laughs> and they really don't like women with glasses for some reason. <laughs> Yeah, they didn't like whatever woman was running right. the chat room, and it ended up being you. Mm -hmm. You were the head writer of the show, Jamie. We used to do... Yeah. Uh, we used to do bits. And yeah, stuff, we used yeah. to do bits, and then um, you were tortured by the chat room. That really was the transition, <laughs> and you were kind enough to stick around. I didn't get a chance to thank the crew in the last show. I'm going to thank everybody in this one um, towards the end. Uh, oh. uh, we used to yell at J-Mac in the crow's nest. At the West Side Comedy Theater, we did the show for several years. There was a little crow, crow's nest in the back of the room where we crawled up one day and said, hey, we can put the equipment and shit in here. And that's where he sat, uh, and we would just yell out to him. He's in an actual uh, production booth now at the Donnie Typewriter Theater, and I'm a little freaked out about it. Yeah, he oh. does not deserve that. Because it's so professional. That nice of booth. He just gave us a little Tuscan Raider, like... Yeah, yeah. He, he did. Followed by two uh, flying birds. Corey laughed Sam's at that comment. one. I heard Corey laugh at my Tuscan Raiders. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, Sammy, you want to start us off with uh, Memory Lane? Uh, ten years, my friend. Ten years. And, uh, uh, boy, what a ten. Um, I, uh, okay, I've got, I've got two weird ones. Uh, well, the first one is, is uh, we had Elon Musk on the show. And that was amazing. Because this was right before he became Tony Stark. Yes. Like he was. Yeah, the Tesla Roadster was out. Was out. The sedan Model S was a, a, a two years from coming out. Yeah, like it was in the works, but it wasn't a thing yet. It was about nine years ago. And yeah, and SpaceX was like just getting its feet wet. Uh, and he came on the show, and I have always thought of him as a very smart, connected guy. Like he knows about technology, social media, what have you. And so he comes on and gives a really great chat. And then at the end of it, you asked him. You know, hey, anything else you want? And he was like, yeah, actually, there is something. And I'm not going to repeat what he said because I, honest to God, don't remember it. But it struck me he then addressed, like, the camera. Then, like, looked down the barrel of his camera and then made a very serious plea about how he'd been unfairly attacked in the press for, like, shit in his personal life. In his and personal life in was his personal the point. Life. And it's, right. on, it's on YouTube. You can watch you it can in watch detail. It, but it always struck me. I was like... I don't think he realizes that this show is being watched by 11 comedy nerds. <laughs> I think he thinks he's on CNN right now. 
He was talking to the world. Or maybe he yeah. takes everything that seriously. I can I could see that where he's just that genuine about everything yeah. he does. Yeah. He, he was everything. dialed in. Yeah. But it it always uh, stayed with me that Elon Musk, who we <laughs> think of as the Tony Stark of our day, I genuinely believe didn't understand a streaming internet show. <laughs> In, in 10 years of doing the show, that was one of only two uh, breaking stories. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other one was when, um, um, let's see, Neil Patrick Harris yeah. and his husband had just announced, the day he arrived, they had just announced a couple hours before that they were adopting kids. Yes. And so he was followed by paparazzi into the parking lot of the show. Yeah. Which was a... F- first and last uh, of the 10 years that yep. I guess was followed by right. paparazzi. Not counting any of the times that happened to me. No. Please. I Please. didn't think that was for public. Right. Uh, and uh, But that was the only t- other time where we felt like, <laughs> we're getting a news item. <laughs> was when uh, Elon Musk addressed the camera and talked about his, his divorce, yeah. basically. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's all there. People say, I have to spend no time with my five children. That's not the case. Yeah. I- and that's happening. I'm going, what is happening? What is going on? <laughs> Who's he talking to? <laughs> it's still, to this day. Uh, is this for lawyer fans yeah. of the show? <laughs> it, was, it was almost like he was thinking about a future deposition. He's going, no, I have evidence. I said it on the record. <laughs> yeah. It's on the internet. The first and last time our show was the record. Yeah. 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 Uh, Jamie, something for us? Um. We were discussing backstage um, if there were any dream guests that we could have had. At, um, and you reminded me of this when you brought up Ghostbusters because my answer, of course, which would have been possible, would be to have had Harold Ramis yep. before he passed in February of 14. But um, currently, I would uh, choose Bill Murray because the man is a Sasquatch. Like you, he yeah. just sho- he's mythical yeah. and he just shows up whatever he feels like. It. And then, w- <laughs> and then weirdly, Dan Aykroyd. So those are the three in order. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, we did have the Crystal Head Vodka on. I went to his uh, one of his uh, distilleries Ooh. in Canada, the Crystal Head Vodka. That video is up there, too, uh, that was overproduced and overshot and overedited. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm at a distillery, and it's uh, about as exciting as you would think. So there were a lot of camera angles of the glass skulls coming down the line. And that was pretty much it. That's all we... <laughs> Had. Um, we had a thing on the show forever called Tweet Five. Oh, I was going to, I wanted you guys to answer that question. Who would have been your dream oh. guest that we did not have? I, w- I would have said uh, either De Niro or Walken. Yeah. Uh, Walken probably more so because it would have been interesting. It would have been, that would have been a lot of fun <laughs> for a variety of reasons. So promise me this yes. if he ever says, yeah, I'll sit down with you. We'll do one bonus episode. We'll do 401. <laughs> yeah. If any of the dream people should say, I understand you've stopped doing your podcast. <laughs> I was hoping we could chat. <laughs> then uh, that's a fuck yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we will come out of retirement that moment. <laughs> I just want to give people hope. Yeah. Sammy, it was a game, a game, a contest, or Sam would, would uh, host. Yeah. Yeah. I used to host uh, Who Tweeted. Who Tweeted. Yeah. And uh, it would stand between the guest and I, and we would compete. Uh, for a while, it was Demi Moore. Yep. Uh, it was varying degree. It was Paris, Paris Hilton, Hilton, Tyra Banks. Demi which Moore, one of these three people tweeted Oprah. the following? And then you would yeah. read the tweet. And then I would try to theme it towards the guest. Yeah. And then I would, like, after that, like, I would pick, like, three celebrities that would... Like, I, like I, when we had Josh Gad on, I think I picked, like, all, like, people, like, from Broadway or something. And like then that. at some point we did Tweet 5 with the audience. I would ask the Twitterverse, I've got Chris Hardwick on the show this week. Give me some questions for him, and I would pick five, and they would come from Twitter, hence Tweet 5. And they were always yes or no. And they were always yes or no this answers. Or that. Oh, yeah, and Dave Keckner did the intro. Dave Keckner. So we're about to see an example of the Chris Hardwick Tweet 5, which was one of my favorite of the 300-plus that we did on camera. If we're somehow ready, let's roll that. Tweet five. It's time for another tweet five. T5, Hugh Kettner. T five. T five forever now. This from Algonac Chick. Algonac Chick. Algonac Chick. 
It's like trying to read. A, it's, like, it's like trying to figure out a license plate. <laughs> okay. Right ahead. What is your pie or pie? Get it? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I go for the. Uh, I, I I don't love. I don't love physical dessert pie, but I love the number pie. What is it about physical dessert pie that you don't? Uh, like and please don't ever call it that again. <laughs> I don't. I don't like uh, how do you say uh, dessert pie. <laughs> it was no tasty to my face hole. <laughs> I don't like uh, dessert pie. <laughs> it was actually the addition of the word physical that I found so offensive. I don't like a pie in the physical universe. <laughs> I like imagination pie. <laughs> the imagination pie is delicious. Because <laughs> I don't have to eat. Yeah, mom, mom, this is the best imagination. Imagination pie can be anything you want. <laughs> anything you want. Could it be crap pie <laughs> if you want? And this pie has a caramel and a tiny quail. It's delicious. <laughs> Uh, we would wrap up every episode at some point with uh, something we called the Larry King game. And the Larry King game um, was introduced. There was a home version that Jamie and I did. I just made it up because he was on, I think it was just a Larry King Live once. And then I just, and you walked, like you were in the other room and you walked into the room. And then I just, I did a Larry King voice and I created this. That, that, that was just a bit I came up with uh, in the uh, moment. Yeah. Useless information yes. he would share. Yes. Um, he would share something you like. You walked back back into the room. I'm like, oh, we're back with Kevin Pollack. I, what was it? Oh, um, I, every Thanksgiving, I like to teabag the gravy boats before the guests arrive. <laughs> <laughs> Oklahoma. I don't know. Yeah. So the when I would tell the guests, the three things I need from you is a bad Larry King impression. Mm -hmm. I don't want it. I'm not interested in a good one. And then uh, some unnecessary fact about yourself as Larry King. About Larry. That was the one I did was always like the go-to example. Yeah, it was the example. Yep. Thanksgiving, I like to teabag the gravy boats before the guests arrive. Schenectady, hello. So <laughs> I would explain that to them, and then they would all do their version of the Larry King game. Right. And I would uh, encourage you to go to the Ken Pollock Chacha YouTube channel because there are uh, a playlist, a singled out uh, list of hundreds that are absurdly great. This one, however... Uh, made number one on my list of the Larry King games. In the fall of 1971, in an Arco station in Button Willow, I had my entire fist up Monty Hall's ass. <laughs> so is that is that kind of what you're going for? Go to the phone. Huh? Go to the phone. Go to the go to the phone. Oh oh oh! Had my entire fist up Monty Hall's <laughs> yeah, Monty or, or Steve McQueen's rectum. I wasn't sure which one you wanted. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. I was in a cornhole stack at the Playboy Mansion in 1968. Merv Griffin was on the bottom, then me, Fess Parker, Ronnie Shell, Art Garfunkel, Trina, Trini Lopez, and Sebastian Cabot. Hef was watching while Otto Premature blew him. Butte, Montana. Yeah. <laughs> they were never so G-rated as that one. Nope. So I wanted to... Uh... My uh, my favorite Larry King game goes. It was a duo. It was Paul Shear and Rob, Rob Hubel. Hubel. Uh, that went on for several minutes. Yeah, Rob Hubel becoming pterodactyl Larry King. Yes, <laughs> literally the birth of a Larry King creature. Yeah, was yeah. what he enacted. Yeah, I would. I, one of my favorites was Nia Vardalis went super blue. Yes, and it was very it was very shocking. And I think she's a brilliant comedic actress and does not get nearly enough credit as she should. Oh, good, good for you and her. No, really. Good on you for doing that and saying that. That came off as insincere and it was the opposite. I really meant that. Yeah, I did come out insincere. I thought you were mocking me like Jim Jeffries in the Epcot thing. <laughs> I heard our guest laughing backstage, actually. I just realized because she, too, thought I was yeah, being an asshole. Please bring her out here. I need another woman out here desperately. Yeah. <laughs> I swear on a stack of small Jewish children that I was being sincere. I just am uh, an asshole. So, uh, all right. So we've got a couple of uh, video send-offs here from former guests that I want to get to, and uh, let's start. I believe with Brian Cranston. Now he's doing a Broadway show uh, called Network, and before it starts, he and other cast members are on stage. So you walk into the sort of living theater thing before it starts, and he's in the sort of glass 
wall production offices. And I remember seated there when we went to see it in previews, thinking, what's he doing back there? Because he was facing away from you, and he's at the back of the stage. Here's what he was doing this night. You'll see people entering the theater and already in their seats. You know, whether you're on a Broadway stage or on a sound stage right there in Santa Monica, it's all the same. It's all about professionalism and personality. And it has been my pleasure to be on the Kevin Pollack show. Exactly two times. And now it's worth mentioning that a congratulation is in order to the cast and crew of the Kevin Pollack show. Congratulations to all of you. Best wishes on your future endeavors. And remember, Kevin Pollack, you should always know that you're a winner to me. And if you can't, then fuck it. Oh man. Yeah. You know there's there's a real there's a real shortage of genuine people in oh, yeah. show business. Yeah. He 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 really fills a void for so us. Raw. So glad. So we raw, are so real. Yeah. So unrehearsed and overdubbed. Uh Peter Mr. Farrelly uh, last weekend picked up two Academy Awards uh, for his incredible work in Green Book. And while he was on the Academy Award press tour, he used one of their film crews, as you'll clearly see, to make this. Kevin Pollack, congratulations on an amazing run. Your podcast was the best. It was the longest interview I ever did in my life. If I remember, it was almost three hours long. We got into everything that ever happened to us in our entire lives, including my UFO story, which I got a lot of grief for, but I stand by. Hey, man, I'm so happy for you. We're going to be seeing you around. You did a good thing, great show, and I wish it wasn't going away, but see you down the road. Uh, yeah. So most yeah. of the people I got to, I said, don't be sincere. Yeah. Well, he doesn't know how bits work. I didn't... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, he's never made a comedy yeah. in his life. Only yeah. known for his heavy hitting dramas. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I forgot to. I feel bad now. I forgot to tell Peter to be anything but sincere, and he was so sweet. Yeah. Uh, but I still wanted to show it. Um, and uh, I guess the reason I thought Dana Carvey was in the first one is because we're about to show the send off from Dana Carvey, and two Dana Carveys is I thought maybe, and I was wrong. It's never enough Dana Carveys. Let's see what Dana had to say. Hi, this is Dana Carvey from Saturday Night Live and Wayne's World. I just like the sound of that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll hold for applause. Congratulations to Kevin Pollack in the chat show. You know, 10 years, that's an accomplishment. A lot of people, a lot of people, believe me, said it'll never work. And they had a point. You, uh, it was pretty fledgling in the early days, you know, no guests, no chair, no microphone, but you had grit. And so I say, hooray. The naysayers can go to hell. Congratulations, Kevin Pollack. Ten years of chat show. And here is the ten more. Oh, no, this is the end of the chat show. This is the end? Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. <sighs> wow. <laughs> We, we broke Dana Carvey that day. We did. <laughs> he couldn't take it. Oh, it was too devastating. Um, and lastly, uh, this one also, um, Ben Schwartz, I'm, I'm not sure of if in his video it was meant to be comedic that we saw his Emmy. In this last video send-off from Mr. Ricky Gervais, uh, you can clearly see in the foreground and background, I think nine awards. <laughs> that was, I know, meant to be funny. And it is, and it was, yeah. and now it will be for you. Hi Kevin, congratulations on your 10 years in podcasting. Um, you're an inspiration to young people everywhere. They look at you and they think, well, if he can do it, then uh, so can I, and they're, they're right, obviously. I mean, acting was easy enough, being told 
you know, where to stand and uh, what to say. But they thought, hold on, why am I standing up and why am I even talking? Um, let's, let's do uh, internet interviews where I'm sitting down and other people uh, are doing uh, all the work. So well done with that. And um, I just can't believe how far you've come considering the, um, the amount of natural talent you, you started with. So, yeah, and I can say that because I'm a friend as far as you're concerned. Um, so yeah, keep up the great work. Cheers. Over on the right side, you could see the BAFTA awards too, not just all yeah. the Golden Globes. Yeah, he probably borrowed a few awards just to <laughs> fill the background. <laughs> yeah. Just to needle you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. That was, uh, that was the big get for me. Um, Tom Hanks was the first one. We started doing the show, and he, I ran into him somewhere, and he said, of course, I'll do your podcast. And then four and a half years later, he was on. Um, well, you know, he was held hostage on a boat. I don't know yeah. if you know that. Yeah. It was part of a negotiation. Yeah. Another big one for us was Larry David. I feel like he really... I wrote down Larry sure David as my sort of number one uh, comedy guy who, during the preamble that this is, unlike our guest today who said, whatever you need, honey, about, uh, I don't know, six or seven minutes of this, and we came to him finally, he said, that was very rude. <laughs> But then about 18 minutes into the interview, he stopped things again and said, he shouted, as only Larry can, you're very good at this. You know what? Yeah. You're very good at this. <laughs> um, yeah. Which I don't know why he was so shocked by that <laughs> and, and had to announce the revelation. He only it's, knew you from your dramatic work. Yeah. That's, exa <laughs> that's exactly Larry right. Larry David is Larry David. Like, it's not a character. That is 100% how he is. Like, I love it. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay. So... Um, the last bit of business we'll do is I, I always like to read a, a fan mail. This, and I earmarked this one a month ago as the very last one. And uh, this is from Ooh, Steve long. Spartano from Westerly, Rhode Island. It's a little long. Can you just give us like a yep. clip notes? Dear Chat Show, I sadly admit that I'm a touch late to the Chat Show party. I discovered the show about a year ago while searching for actor interviews and fell in love with it. I've been familiar with your wonderful work over many years. I enjoy the in-depth, long-form discussions. It's been the perfect show for me, being that about six years ago I got involved with my local community theater, so having the opportunity to listen to the likes of John Larroquette, Tony Shalhoub, was just the insight I was looking for. I must also thank you, thank you, thank you for introducing us, my wife and I, to The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel and Patriot. They are fantastic shows. I've watching both seasons now of The Maisel uh, for the second time. Uh, you'd be hard-pressed to find any straight 50-year-old men who work construction that love the Maisel as much as I do. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Every time I watch a show, I discover something new. I do a couple of quick, I do have a couple of quick questions. Is that Buddy Holly and the Smothers Brothers performing at the Gaslight in season one? No. <laughs> what kind of car, year, make, or model are you driving at the Catskills episode in season two? I don't know. <laughs> I was sad to hear the chat show be coming to an end. 10 years is a long run, so I understand I've also noticed that you're no longer asking guests to give their best Larry King stories, and I was wondering why I, too, have a Larry King game. I used to have uh, ask fans to call in theirs, and if it was good enough, I would send them a T-shirt, and I'm sending one to Steve, and here's why. I'd be honored if you'd look down the barrel one last time and do one more and tell the audience my Larry King. One time, after a long night of highballs, quaaludes, and Puerto Rican male strippers, I titty-fucked Raymond Burr <laughs> while sharing a cab ride to Coney Island. Schenectady, what do you say? <laughs> Steve Spartano. Steve, I swear to God, if that T-shirt winds up at Goodwill. <laughs> yeah, so people did ask over the years, what was your top ten? And... Uh, I did scribble it down. Larry David, Elon Musk, Ricky Gervais, Tom Hanks, Christopher Guest, Bill Hader, Jim Brooks, Billy Bob Thornton, Seth MacFarlane, and Allison Janney. Um, I've been asking our, our guests that we're you getting... You didn't even have my number one on there. Yep. I've been uh, asking our guests now uh, <laughs> for a little over a year, maybe a year and a half, and um, I'm so very glad that not only it worked out, but it ended up being our very last episode ever. She is um, uh, a new hero of mine. Um, 
a longtime hero to many. Uh, easily, uh, you could say, I suppose, uh, the only woman who co-created their own show and then wrote and directed and starred in uh, every episode. Um, and it's been uh, an absolute privilege and a ridiculous amount of fun and laughter uh, playing uh, her brother in season two. And uh, I guess I'm allowed to say coming back in season three as such. Please welcome Pamela Adlon. <laughs> They didn't have a smaller umbrella when you um, went to the umbrella place? It was freezing back in the States. <laughs> so I'm sitting with all my shit. And I'm like, I'm not going to leave my wallet back there. No. I'm not going to leave my phone back there. I'm not going to leave my car keys back there. So I just brought everything. Hi. Aww. Uh, thank you for being here for the last hour, I'm assuming. <laughs> Get all that Jim Jeffries crap. Can you smell him? <laughs> I have a couple of issues. So With what he had to say. Anyway. Yeah. No, I loved it. Oh. It was amazing. But now I'm in an even worse position than he was. Yeah. This fucking sucks. <laughs> you guys just talked about your dream people <laughs> <laughs> that you never got. I'm freezing. I'm starving. I'm like, why am I here? <laughs> <laughs> to be tortured. Let's do it like really short. Like it's it's okay. We don't need me for a long time. We're fine. We're fine. <laughs> also, you're on Mrs. Fucking Maisel, and I forget that. And she fucking beats me every award, everything. It's always Mrs. Maisel, and I'm like. Oh, fuck, he's on Mrs. Maisel, too. Nobody even knows that you're on this other little show. <laughs> on FX called Better Things Coming Back uh, on... It started, it started last yeah. night. I, or Thursday, we premiered it, season three. Season one, uh, season three debuted February 28th. <laughs> yes. 28th. And uh, unlike other ridiculous shows in the modern day, uh, they are sparsed out one week at a time on the FX network. I want to just say there was a... a I wanted to wait for you to come out here to say this. There was a, a premiere the other night of the first two episodes, which I insanely enjoyed. She hates compliments, so I'll keep it to that. But okay. the greatest moment was <laughs> on the very first day on the set of working with Pamela, I walked up to her and I didn't know this about her and started saying what a, how much this and that I loved and loved. And you, I, shy of spitting in my face, just said, yeah, you need to know this, this doesn't work, what you're doing right now. <laughs> I was nicer than that. Yeah, I don't remember that. I remember... I was like, I'm fine. We're fine. It's yeah. fine. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. You said that, and then it read to me as, what the fuck are you doing? Get away from me. Uh, so at the premiere, the head of the network, the president of the network, the main guy for FX, John oh Landgraft, gets on stage to introduce the first two episodes. Introduce Pamela, who's going to introduce the first two episodes. So just to get the president of the whole damn thing to show up is already ridiculous and insane to a premiere party you're doing for cast and crew and friends. Then he pulls out of his pocket five reviews of season three. And I'm watching the president of the network hawk your show by, it's a Jewish term meaning sell, uh, <laughs> by reading the reviews to a captive audience who already loves you. You know, it wasn't being televised, this thing he was reading to your friends and family. It was my mother <laughs> and all my gay best Every, friends. Yeah. A gathering of 300 people who love you madly, and the president of the network is up there reading. No, you need to understand how good this show is. <laughs> <laughs> right? This person of the New York Times said, okay, we're here because we love her. Why are you? Uh, it was beautiful that uh, he felt the absolute need to get up and do that. Um, and uh, uh, you got up and spoke eloquently and also uh, hilariously, but about, you know, the little bit of the journey about getting back into it and doing the show. And you spoke about a writer's room for the first time and, and that. But I want to start with... Um, you are really a mother, a single mother of three wonderful daughters. Uh, what point in their uh, lives, first of all, did you become the single mother? Um, well, my oldest. Sure. Who's here, Gideon. What? 
She's 21 now. She was uh, just turned 12. My middle just turned nine, and uh, the uh, Rocky, the baby, t had just turned six. So. Okay, so six, nine, and 12. Yeah. Uh, so walk me through when it starts to get funny to you, because when you watch <laughs> the show, <laughs> because when That's you watch amazing. the show, it's fucking hilarious, but when you're living it... I wasn't funny then. Nope. <laughs> at all. Yeah, no, tragedy plus time. That's the rule. The time. The time and, and the perspective. So, uh, you know, it's just everything is... You know, also, uh, when you're a new mom or a new parent, you're in a daze. You're just in a cave. You, you don't really... You know, you don't realize, oh, my God, I just had another kid. Oh, I just had another kid. You do it when you've got the diapers and the bottles around for some reason. It's just this thing. But, um, yeah, I kind of was in that cave. I call it a cave. And then when uh, we separated, um, me and the girl's dad, the guy I was married to, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> You don't remember his name? It was so long ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> stepping yeah, yeah. lightly around careful, careful. things. Um, it, I guess there was a, a, a time where I kind of got out of my cave and sure. I started reaching out to friends. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, uh, you don't really, when you're in a relationship and you have the kids, you're in that. And then you realize, oh, uh, I can, I, you don't get a lot of invitations <laughs> when you have, you know, three kids. The invitations aren't a lot. So, you know, um, we would start to, uh, I, I would go back to my friends that I kind of lost when I became a mom, or when I got married, when I became a mom and doing all of that stuff. And it was really my friends, my village, that gave me perspective and then being able to talk my my shit out and being able to do that um and and seeing you know uh and having people throw things back at me um helped me yeah. get back on my feet but then um it seems like tragedy doesn't even feel funny until you're around someone you can trust enough to bitch about it and because you're a funny person, when you bitch about it, it just comes out funny. It doesn't come out as actual complaining. Well, there's this thing, you know, I have a friend right now who's going through a horrible, horrible thing. We're going to bring them out next. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> She'll cry for you. Um, anyway, I mean, but gladly, because the biggest gift that friends can do is, you know, we'll be at the gym, and she gets there a little bit before me because she's got uh, young kids, and um, so I walk in, and she's crying. <laughs> and I go, uh-oh, and the woman across from her, we work out at a women's-only gym, so <laughs> it's even better than you could imagine because, like, the... 70 year old woman across from her is looking at her and she's crying. I'm like, she's crying because she's almost 50 and her husband just left her. It's hilarious. She's crying rivers. And I'm like, also, she's got two young kids. It's worse than you could even imagine. She can't pay her rent. And my friend is hysterically crying and the woman's looking like this. She's like, the fuck? But we die over her misery. Like, it's the funniest thing in the world. It's hilarious. So if you have somebody that can reflect your misery back on you... Your actual pain. Your pain. And, and all I could do is laugh because I look at her and I say, I see your future. Yeah. I see it. And I know you're going to get through this. And right now, this is hysterical, even though it's the worst thing in the world. <laughs> So you can't wait for your friend to laugh about it, too. <laughs> She's laughing through the tears. Yeah. That's the thing, you know. That's what I, I like to do in the show. And I don't, you know, because a, a lot of things suck, at, you know. And it's just if you kind of look at it in a certain way. I like doing the show, our show, it's your show. in a way <laughs> that Jewish sharing. That's right. Um, in a way that... I like to look at the world yeah. 
It's the way I reflect on things. And I have this ability, and it's become a superpower of mine to not take things so personally anymore. Because um, I know that 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 woman who's in line behind me making a cunty comment, <laughs> or the woman who was at the FedEx box, I didn't see the sign. I'm online. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, and I'm shaking. And I get behind her, and I said, well, obviously you want to get in a fight with somebody because you know I didn't see the sign. No, I don't. Um, well, I think you do. <laughs> I think you do. And also, this shit's gonna end up in my show, bitch. So. <laughs> Everybody better tread lightly around me because all this shit is going in. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what happens. Yeah. That's like the best revenge. That you can oh, just it's like amazing. put it in your show. It's like, amazing. Fuck the- with me, <laughs> I get gold. You fuck with me, you're going to get you fucked get face. with on yeah. FX. But the weird thing is that people, if you told them, you know, that's based on that awful thing that you did to me at the store. Oh. Right, exactly. Oh, they're so flattered. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and you can't tell them in the moment, keep it up, asshole, it's not a threat. Exactly. Right. It's only a great revenge. Season, you know? season eight, you're like, oh, you're just fucking with people, so yeah. you can get, <laughs> yeah. get material. You're creating problems exactly. in your own life just to try to get through the season. Exactly. Uh, I gotta go to Verizon because something uh, bad is bound to happen there. Yeah, that is the perfect. It's my worst misery. Yeah, I gotta call AT and T and do something with somebody on the phone. Anyway, yeah. Hi. Oh, hi. It's a uh, television, Sam Levine. I um. <laughs> I think I think people know me for, more from the internet now. Honest to God. Okay, good. He and he was an inglorious bastard. Well. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah, I am. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. What is this? I just became your mother. Yeah. You know, my son's the little Jew. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. Oh, he nice. was uh, this close to Brad Pitt shooting Nazis. Oh, wait, but the other guy was talking about <laughs> Brad Pitt. Yeah, I didn't bring it up then. What are you doing? <laughs> Well, so 10 years of this, and I, I decided when people kept asking why, 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 you know, they were happy that the show was ending, but they still felt the need to ask why. And I would say, well, I, I think my, one of my favorite Jewish terms is it's enough already. <laughs> and I think that applies to good and bad things. You know, when good things happen to you, it's, it's enough already. And that's what I was sensing when I tried to compliment you <laughs> that first time. You were basically saying it's enough already. <laughs> well, it's... It's interesting because I think that, you know, you're putting an end to this one, but it doesn't mean you're not going to do something else Mm -hmm. in the future. It's just like, you know, this one needs to go to bed for a little bit. I've never even heard of it until (laughs) fucking today. I'm like, fuck, I'm backstage for seven hours while you're, and I'm like, look up Kevin Pollack (laughs) chat show, (laughs) previous things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> There's a heading now on Google called Previous Things. Previous Things. <laughs> yeah. But um, that's her prequel, that Previous your... Things. <laughs> exactly. Oh, nice. The Better There's Things prequel. Stranger <laughs> Things, Previous Things. And Thank you for Mrs. the two people that laughed at that. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but enough already. So the w- reason I brought it up was uh, drawing from real life in order to create for the show. Um, as a fan of the show first. You know, I guess we should. I, I'll tell people how we met. So Jamie and I go up to uh, San Francisco Sketch Fest every year. I'm from there, and a friend of our friend of the show, Cole Stratton, co-created the thing, and so it's one of the things we look forward to every year. So we go backstage a couple years ago to one of the theaters where I'm going to moderate a reunion of the King of the Hill cast. And I walk in backstage, and I can't remember who it was, but somebody came up to me and said, um, Pamela Adlon is here, and she's excited to meet you. <laughs> and we had just, Jamie had just said, you need to fucking watch the show. And we just watched the whole thing of Better Things. But wasn't it, we met before the King of the Hill reunion. I was doing something up there, and I knew you were, I was there with Florence Henderson. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's oh. right. No, you, yeah. Baruch Hashem. <laughs> <laughs> or the non-Jewish version <laughs> for Flo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I was ridiculously excited to meet and gush about the 
the show. I was all Indian Summer. Yeah. The guy from Indian Summer. That's right. That's right. N- 90s Kevin. Jamie will That's tell what you. I remembered. I was like, oh, she loves Indian Summer, which is a great movie. And that's yes. when Kevin was very big in the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> as, he, as he would tell me all the time. Yeah. Which, I was big in the 90s. Which makes me who? Bo- you're Bojack Horseman. <laughs> but, without all, but without all the depressing stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Without all the drug and drinking problem. But yeah. you were the guy. You were the horse that was very big in the 90s. Um, <laughs> So we had this moment backstage, I was very excited, and it was there that, that um, we, we, we started uh, texting, and then very, very soon after, you texted and said uh, something about playing your brother on the show. So my question was, during season one, uh, I think you recall there are references to a brother, but we don't see him, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So was it always sort of the plan at some point, I want to I wanna bring... My brother, who my character on the show doesn't get it, get along with at all, unlike real life. Yeah. Well, you know, I I I wasn't really trying to do an exact thing like my family that I grew up with. I had a father, I had a, an English mother, and I had a brother. Um, but it just I don't know. Uh, I I I'm inspired by the bones of my life, so. Um, uh, I mean, my brother is so fucking into you, bro. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> because I'm portraying him? Yes. <laughs> and he's a huge Kevin Pollack fan. From the 90s. We got clear. We, we do. Not the now Kevin no, Pollack. Right. No. The no. one from the he, 90s. He's a big yeah. She's All That fan. Yeah, probably. That's a great movie. Are you seriously in that? That's amazing. <laughs> I play the girl's father. Yeah, no big deal. I don't even know what that is. Sam's just yeah, yeah. jealous because he's in the poor man's version, not another teen movie. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, the poor man's version would have been an earnest him. rom-com. <laughs> Hers is a parody film. Uh, they'll Amazing. go. They'll go. Um, <laughs> but so, so yeah, I mean, in in life, your your British mother lives nearby. And, and you, you start to write what you know, and you start to drift towards... The ridiculous things, and you find this wealth of material. Look, this is what a stand-up does when they finally find their own voice. Everything in their life becomes material. Um, my underst- I don't re- remember that you did stand-up. No. No. But you came up through the comedy writing and, and, and acting, and um, the idea to finally feed your own character who was similar to your life just started to make more and more that sense was- to represent your own life. It was difficult for me to think about doing a show for me because I'm not somebody who I, I I've never really been like a you know Pop like culture. you. <laughs> no, I mean like I want to like have a the confidence. Star? No, no. But I didn't I not I a did, performer. You're not you don't like uh, to, yes, yes, that's yeah. what I'm trying to say. I'm I'm like oh, I'm you like didn't a, suffer from hey look at me. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Which I learned about him on the first day when we were on the set, and he's like, "Where's the camera? Where's the camera?" Yeah, and I was like, "Oh, I, I see." Yeah, we're but <laughs> oh, we were rehearsing. Like, first of all, I want to be clear. No, I know what a camera looks like. <laughs> we were rehearsing before the crew came in and set up the cameras, and That's I was right. asking, "Where will the camera be?" Mm. Because I had learned from other actors. Nah. Yeah. What direction? Exactly. <laughs> what direction to look? Exactly. Yeah, and you thought, uh-oh, here's trouble. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but I totally forgot what. <laughs> what we are talking about bringing the reality of your show, and also I was going to ask: Is there an effort at some point when you get too close to certain things from your life? Do you then, in the writer's writing process, start to shy away from yeah, or is anything open material? It feels, uh, you know, I I know like when I first started uh, going into territory that felt ootsy or uncomfortable, um, I I know that that's a great place to go. I I mean, when you just start freaking out and and thinking about, you know, I don't want to write about uh, the guy I used to be married to uh, or even reference any kind of relationship like that. But what I'm doing is I'm... um, I'm sh- I'm shedding light in a way, and then 
I realize it's like if you write something that's just bigger than you could ever imagine. You know, you want to shoot at Dodger Stadium and then do something awful with this person or whatever. Um, I found that you just have to get it all down mm. and then you could do whatever version of it you end up doing. So that's been a big thing for me. And at what point do you decide, well, fuck it, I'll just direct every episode? Um, <laughs> that's a big swing of the bat. Yeah, it well the 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 biggest thing was my network supporting me doing that. Um Right. So you got to sell it to yourself first though. That's true. As an idea. It's true because when you, you know uh you sit with it when I sat with it I was like oh fuck yeah. like you know I I mean I never had aspirations to direct at all anyway. I never thought I never I never thought that big. I never was, um, you know, thinking that I ever would be anything other than, like, sitting waiting for pilot season. Maybe an episode of Jake and the Fat Man's gonna come around. I shouldn't go on a trip. <laughs> you should be available. I should be available. Yeah. yeah. Let's improvise that phone call, by the way, with <laughs> with the agent to the actor who ultimately played the Fat Man. Yeah. So I've got the script for you. And uh, what is it? When does it? Shoot? Oh, it's great. It's a two-hander detective thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh huh. And uh, there's the handsome guy, uh, yeah. uh, uh -huh. Jake, and then there's this other character. Oh, uh, okay. That they want you for. <gasps> Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna send it over. Okay. And never mind the title. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. When's it for? Because I have a trip planned to Africa, and I with I, your family. Yeah. yeah I you're really. Not, you're not going. Oh. <laughs> but I don't think I'll ever get another chance to go to Africa again. Do you think I sh still shouldn't go? I'm your agent, so the answer is you should not go. Oh, okay. Yeah. But you think there might be really a shot? You're not even on the short list for the part. I just think this is a hell of an opportunity. Okay, I'm going to Africa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, that, that is where we're at until we decide to be pro proactive. It's the worst thing you can do. It is the worst. Like, Waiting you have to... to ring. You have to live your life. I just think it's better now. I mean, because during that time, um, th it, it was such a waste of time because it was literally like, this is pilot season, this is pilot season. And, and so, um, oh, why did I start directing? Um, anyway, <laughs> sorry, went off the rail. Um, so. That is the show. But that. <laughs> but I am genuinely curious because well, it's a giant thing to I take didn't on. I didn't have those aspirations so it's amazing that I am now sitting here and I was that little girl in my early 20s waiting for the phone to ring and now there's absolute the terrifying thing is there's no excuse anymore mm -hmm. you have everything at your fingertips you have every single um kind uh, you you could make a whole TV show on your phone you know, and 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 you guys do. And Academy Award-winning director Steven Soderbergh insists on shooting movies on his phone now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe it. I mean, the guy who shot the, the one with the. Um, nice, nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she's got. Her, at she's the donut. Yeah, um, that's great. That's terrific. <laughs> the donut with the. Thank you. Well, don't Jesus. Yell at, don't yell at me. Thank you. That we can't remember shit. Um. I'm older. No, but Soderbergh now has directed, uh, I believe, two. There was one quite recently with um, with the British actress who played the, the queen. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's back what, at you. That's right. The British actress who played Kev, the queen. Um, in, the, in the TV show The Crown. Yeah, uh, Claire so Foy. She Listen, start, Do you uh, do you know if they're well, still um, uh, looking for the the role of the fat man? Because I'm available. He's been sitting with that one. I can't stop thinking about it. <laughs> He's just, fuck, fat man, Jake and the fat man. They're yeah. talking. He's I got also a pissed that we ran through the rest of the oh, opportunity. Oh, absolutely. We never even got to the fat man part. <laughs> I know. We went to Africa. Abandoned. Sorry, uh, Sam. No, it's all right. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's the last time. Uh, so, so there are too many opportunities available to you, and you have no excuses to do everything and anything that you want to do. You're limited by your imagination. But That's still, right. to announce to yourself the mirror and ultimately the president of the network, you know what, I'm just going to go, fuck it. I'm just going to go ahead and direct every episode. Yeah. It, That's it, crazy. But you're right. It's something that I have to 
decide, oh, can I, can I do this? I mean, I am the director of a uh, record on two episodes in season one. Season one. Um, and so... It's not a director's medium. It's a showrunner's medium television. That's right. So as the showrunner, you are already directing and post-producing every episode for sure. But still, to be the director in season two of every single yeah. episode. Yeah. Well, I was able to take it in a, in a, in a different direction, you know, and... Um, really make it not, you know, something more than just... Artistic. You wanted to go artistic, is what this... I wanted this, it, is yeah, I wanted it, this shit to look good. I yeah. wanted it to look good. You know, I wanted it to be my aesthetic. I wanted it to look the way I like things to look. I wanted it to sound the way I like things to sound. I wanted everybody to feel real. I, I wanted to have feelings when I made it, and so, and feelings when I I watch it and I present it, so... Uh, that's uh, you know I, I I call it the incredible feeling show because that's the way it, it's all over the place. Yeah, the incredible feelings. Yeah, but no, there is uh, there are moments in season two and now in season three already from what I saw in the first two episodes that are almost Ter Terrence Malick inspired in the sense that uh, I don't need to jump in and, and create this story that we're going to follow just yet. I I would like to have you look at some some beautiful images that begin to tell the story. Yeah, I, I uh, you know, this is an amazing gift that I get to have because of the platform I'm on, uh, my network FX, which is they don't, they don't need everything buttoned up. And so I want it to be up to people's interpretation. I don't want to tell people, you know, one time somebody called me and said, why does everybody touch the statue at the top of the stairs on the top of the head? And I'm like, no. But you understand why they were asking. Because they want an answer. Because it's an unusual consistency that, right. th that is not explained. Right. So they're so dialed into your storytelling that they need to know but what I, the hell that is. I like that. I like those yeah. weird things, those little things that people do in, in their lives, the little mindsies, you know? And like that particular thing came from... No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Just testing. No. Just testing. Don't tell anyone. I mean... <laughs> You've already told me, but don't tell them. Um, so, all right, so season three is a whole new uh, world, and you have to create a writer's room, and you have to uh, listen to the writers in the room, and like any creative, positive, successful showrunner, somehow stop yourself from rewriting every single sentence, or do you do it anyways because that's just the nature of the beast? Well... We we would discuss stories in the room, and so you break stories. Right? I threw up. Yes, we would break stories. <laughs> There's nine people that watch or listen that don't know what we're talking about. And, uh, and so I wrote down all the characters that um, I was interested in, um, and that I wanted to continue. You know going down the road with. <laughs> Although Greg Cromer's really fucking pissed at me. <laughs> Because he's in one this season, but spoiler alert. Yeah. After hitting a grand slam in yeah. season two with you, maybe the for me in my universe, the most mentioned yeah. scene. And that scene with you and him in the truck in yeah. season two. No, is, Jeff, no. Is, is, it's like a comedy clinic. It's like, okay, what do you want to do? Do you want to write? Do you want to act? Do you want to direct? Whichever one of those three. <laughs> let's just go ahead and have you watch the scene, and you'll know how to do all three. Well, his face, too, with oh. my hand over his mouth, his eyes bugging out. But um, <laughs> it, it was um, kind of just being able to... Uh, I, I wanted things to be a little bit more cohesive this year, and I wanted it to be a story. Um, and it was, um, I wanted to see the people kind of unraveling in the world, which mm. is the way the world is around me anyway. You see people flourishing, but then you see people kind of losing their shit all the time, so. Especially the family dynamic. It's yeah. a daily struggle. Yeah, it's true. To work through the mud. Yeah, 
And um, I remember going to FX and kind of like, it wasn't, I wasn't pitching my season to John Langraff, but he just wanted me to tell him to kind of like walk him through what the stories were. And right. um, it was a 10 episode season and I was on episode nine and, I, and it was this hot, dry room and thank God I brought my, my flask because I was like sitting there and I got dry and then I said, uh, this is a 12 episode season, by the way. Okay, and then we see Sam in the bathroom and it was very bold and very cheeky and they um, and they bought the whole season and I was able to to tell all these stories. I mean, my first episode, I can tell you this because it's already aired, but took place in Chicago. I thought we were going to Chicago. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Um, another episode I wrote for New York, I could not go to New York, so Silly I had to... Goose. <laughs> yes, I know. Remember we had this conversation and you were like, you told me where the premiere for Maisel was. You're like Maisel premiere. The Rainbow Room. No, it was the premiere party in Italy. Or oh, so. there was yeah, in Milan. There yeah, was a premiere. Milan, Italy. I'm like, I can't fucking my beloved show. I can't fucking go to New York or whatever. You're like Milan. <laughs> we went to fucking Milan. Uh, there's a carving station at the read throughs. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> it's really amazing. It really is the whole thing in a nutshell. Just say that. I know. Like, um, 12 days an episode, four days an episode. <laughs> Amazing. It's absurd. It's truly absurd. Wow. Which just speaks more volumes to, uh, <laughs> to the ridiculous nature of how good a show can be with, with no money. It's one of the first things you said to me. I'd love you to do this show. You've got to know you're going to make $7. Yeah. Because that's all I'm making, and exactly. that's all anybody's making. Oh, my God. And so everyone came on board because they loved what you were doing, clearly. Um, Thank you. Yeah. It's Sammy? not about the money. No, no. It doesn't have to be. The money will yeah. come. Yeah. I, I thought maybe you had a question. You oh, no. I, was, I, I wholeheartedly You were engaged. Agree. I was engaged, sure. and, and you're absolutely right. And it is. I had no idea four days uh, is all you get per episode. That's ridiculous. Sometimes. Yeah. 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 And we, and yeah. We, we, we go hard. Yeah, there, no, there's a block shooting thing necessary in certain locations where this is from episode this and this is from episode that. We just have this space. Yeah, we shoot pieces from, uh, you know, six to eight episodes a day, uh, 10 to 13 pages a day. And I just try to keep my head on straight. And, uh, you know, I have my script supervisor and my first AD. And my first AD will come up to me and she'll say, uh, I'd like to speak to the director, Pamela, now. <laughs> and uh, I'll go, okay, yeah. And then, um, I, like I said at the, at the premiere, I'm like the thing with two heads. It's Ray Moland or Rosie Greer. That's right. And so which one do you want? So I say, okay, and I adjust, and we, we plan our shots. We do logistics. We talk about the day, our actors, scheduling, everything. And then Babette, my script supervisor, will come over to me and she'll say, I'd like to speak to the actor Pamela now. And she would say, she'd hold up the script and say, did you want to say, <laughs> did you want to, yeah, do you want to, like pointing to the things that I didn't say, everything that I, I lost in my script. Or she would just come up to me and say, are you acting in this? Wow. <laughs> and I would be like, Copy that! Cool! <laughs> um, you know, and y you just need somebody who does that to you. It's like, you know, me making fun of my friend's misery. Like, I just need somebody to go, honey, you're not here. You know, wake up or whatever. Just uh, uh, an adjustment. And so that's why, um, you know, it's not me doing it by myself. It's, it's me doing it with this team. We all need Cher from Moonstruck. Sna slapping us and saying, Snap out of it! <laughs> oh, all right, take me to the bedroom. Leave nothing but the bones. <laughs> you got any whiskey? <laughs> I'll do the whole fucking movie. <laughs> I, I would have done Larry King too, but I need to hear him before, so yeah. anyway. So you still have time, and the trick to that is. You don't get to hear him because I don't want you to sound like him. I want you to sound like <laughs> Bobby Hill <laughs> doing his Larry King. Oh. Yeah. Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> so interesting that you would say that to me, Kevin. 
Anyway, this is Robert Jefferson Hill coming for you from the, I don't know what the fuck this theater's name is. <laughs> and I love Larry King. I grew up watching him. And Schenectady, hello! <laughs> uh, or whatever he yeah, said. Yeah, no, that's it. I don't know. Uh, everyone's making fun of the name of the Dynasty Typewriter Theater. And it is such an extraordinary venue. And, and um, so there. Um, but it's the Hayworth, and I was looking for a fucking Dynasty typewriter theater. At the Hayworth. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. <laughs> See, there are confusing directions to be had. The Kleenex Center of... Yeah. Facial uh, tissue. Sorry. Facial <laughs> tissue, right. The Kleenex Center of facial tissue. Jamie, you hate like... Hell to be put on the spot. So I'm gonna, wow. I'm gonna do this question as slowly as possible. But you, Epcot. the one who my answer is Epcot. Yeah. yeah. You. I was so impressed that you knew that. That was amazing. <laughs> uh, yeah. You turned me on to better. Really, things. it makes me dumb white trash that I know that. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> no, it makes you a cool nerd. I like. Yeah. It. Hey, that's what I like to yeah. think. Yeah. That's why I needed you out here. That's why right, you called for her. I My did. question is, you turned me on to better things. You're mm -hmm. the one who told me about it. And so from, from I'm going to just say it, the woman's perspective, uh, you are not a mother of three. Um, you, so watching the show, can you, can you uh, are, are think of things that connected to you or spoke to you? The strong female lead, and then it all her, you know, and I came from a house with a, a single mother. with uh, She had three daughters. I mean, we're... Uh, um, my sisters are 10 or 15 years older than I am. And then, you know, they were like, whenever my father left, I was like eight. And they were like, you know, like one was in college and one was, you know, like working and stuff. But no, that, that's how I can, that's definitely why I connected to it. It's because I had a single career driven mother that was ra raising three daughters. Well, basically raising one daughter at that point, but she had three daughters. Yeah. There, it was that simple. I didn't know that. That's amazing. Now, I, one of the reasons I asked is because you, you, have to be contacted by uh, either on the street or everywhere you go who, for, by people who've seen the show, women in particular, who also want to explain or share their connection. When you are in your bubble making, breaking stories, deciding what part of your life you will share and won't, and we're, we're on set making the show, and you're in post, that magical place, the final rewrite, um, which I want you to speak to next, please. Let's remind me, young people. Um, that's why the 37-year-olds are here. Um, He's not quite 37 yet. Thank you. It's very important we got to the bottom of yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> He's like another week to go. Yeah. That's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when you are approached by these people who are very, very touched by what it is you're doing, um, you're doing it for yourself first. Uh, you want people who have uh, allowed you to do this to be proud of what you're doing. You want people that you know and love to be proud of what you're doing, but then to be approached by people that are total strangers who really want you to know how the show connected to you. Um, is setting aside for a second how you don't want compliments necessarily, maybe that's just from people you know, I don't know. How do you process? Well, it's not, you know, I. Uh, people get emotional so um but they're they're relating to i like i like people to be passionate i i like the the passionate reaction you know as opposed to y you know oh you oh you're on that show oh yeah good one thank you yeah <laughs> don't break a nail with the compliment exactly oh you're you play on the thing mhm mm, -hmm. mm. So yeah, thanks for that. Uh, yeah, what are you supposed to get from that? <laughs> but um, I like, you know, I like it. I like uh, the stuff being, you know, like people love King of the Hill, and so that's uh, when uh, people started to be like really effusive with things that I was involved with, and I and I knew I was very lucky, you know, uh, to be a part of something that wasn't just um, junk food. Right, and so we go one step further with something that you are putting all the blood and heart and soul into and sort of living and dying by all of your own instincts mm -hmm. and wits that fueled your 
confidence at some point to say, I will direct every episode. You know, at some point, it's not a matter of being in charge of everything, which you s still don't want to do. It's a matter of, oh, I've got all these tools yeah. that I can now get the best department heads yeah. to work with me. Well, but it's 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 not as difficult as you you know it may seem it's j it's it's literally what i said like my sensibility and um you know how uh, i mean i grew up in this so when i would be on shows or on sets and an actor would be directing i always loved it mm. when david duchovny was directing he would direct the first episode of every season of californication and he was great um, and, you know, like Peter Berg is a great director and just th there's a certain uh, way that we've learned being in front of the camera and then kind of sitting by the sidelines and just I would ask questions uh, my whole time coming up when I was a kid actor and, and further and um, now people are asking me, oh my God, you're directing, you're, you're doing all of it. Um, I look back at my life. I've always been uh, recording, or um, uh, you know, I had I got my first video camera when I was twenty, and I did not put it down for about seven years. Mm -hmm. And I have some crazy. I have. I went to this club in Hollywood, and this guy named Miracle shot on the American flag, and they sprayed lavender glade in the club. I took pictures of the whole fucking thing. And I recorded the whole thing. And I thought that was very important, you know, because of historical things. I had a little, <laughs> I have those pictures in case. What was his name? Miracle. <laughs> I thought you said Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to be silly, make you laugh. Um, uh, so you're, you're, you're coming up and you're chronicling yeah. things and, and that's that's one of those instincts. I had a Super 8 camera. I d you know I had a tape recorder. I you know I made a video for an MTV make my video contest for Madonna. Uh, I oh was my. top ten. I was so fucking excited. What? No, oh, I'm I'm very impressed. No, I was you know so it was always these things. I made a documentary with uh, my friend Karen. We shot it on 16 millimeter. We cut it on 16. Uh, we we were with this group of homeless people for a year downtown. That we got into the Cleveland International Film Festival. And that's about. It. So I look back, and it's like I've always been doing these little scripts and scraps, and so um, you know, and always learning, and I'm always asking questions. So and you love it. I I, I do. I love it. I love working. I really love working and earning, uh, uh, making a living. But the process of of directing and then getting into post. All oh, I love it. You've you've come to. I love post. Yeah, it's like I just you know I they they make me packets um, when I'm shooting, so it'll say you know day 27, and it'll have the breakdown of all the scenes that we do. So maybe it'll be like 10 or 14 scenes, and it'll have the episode numbers, and and I'll look through it, and it, and. So then the next day it says day 28. So I finally said to the guy who made my packages, don't put the days because I'm short timing. Like, uh, and I didn't want a short time. Like day oh. 27 of a 50 day shoot. I didn't want to be like, a sh you know, like if you're at war and you're almost home and the, then that bullet and then, <laughs> then your family gets a fucking flag and the whole thing. I was like, poo, poo, poo. Don't tell me what fucking day it is. I, I'm almost out. So let me so let me enjoy it. You have to be able to enjoy it. You can't, you know, uh, uh, production is making your 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 bricks and post is building your house. So you can't get off before you get into post. You have to enjoy all of all of it. The I think that the the most difficult thing for me is not being able to play with the actors as much, mm. you know, because I have to pay attention to everything, um, and I love being with my actors so much. So well, that comes across to us. We don't feel neglected. Cool. Yeah, when we talk to each other about you, I've not heard anyone <laughs> say, and I would love to tell you otherwise. What's Mrs. Maisel like? <laughs> I don't care.
I love that you purposely mispronounce it. Now listen. Am I? What? I don't even. How do you? T- why would you? Oh, is you- it more Jewish than that? It is. It's got a little more chuch than you're pronouncing. <laughs> that's it. Okay. Yep. Yeah, no, that's it. That's it exactly. Fine. We are completely and utterly out of time. I don't know how that Thank happened. Thank God. We I'm did starving. a little over an hour. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Are you kidding? That's the greatest. That's the greatest for me when I look up and went, fuck, it's been, yeah. Sorry. Um, thank you thank endlessly you. for being on the thank last. Thank you for, what an honor. Well, whatever. I, congratulations. Whatever. Kevin. That's what you sound like. Oh, by wait, the way. what's the yeah, thing yeah. I'm supposed to say? Oh, I don't know. The thing do when I say, yeah. It's enough already. It's enough already. Thank, thank you. you. One person paying attention. That guy right there, he fucking cares. Thank you, bro. Uh, would you mind sitting uncomfortably while I thank these No, two? let's do it. Yeah. Uh, Samuel Franklin Levine. That is correct. Thank you. Well done. Uh, Jamie and I were sitting home one day, and we decided, uh, I decided, I announced to her I was going to seek your attention out and called up agents and lawyers and found you. It's true. And uh, we became. We were watching friends. Freaks and Geeks, and yep. I was like, "It's Minnie You. We gotta, we gotta meet this guy. It's like the <laughs> son that you. This you may, this you may have uh, had a son that you are not not yep. aware of. I mean, for for no other reason, let's find out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's get to the bottom of this. And then when I reached out to you about doing this show ten years ago, uh-huh. uh, you waited a nanosecond before. Uh, you were there to support, and, and of course, in any way you sh- you can. We we looked it up, or you you got, came up with thirty eight episodes that you guest hosted. And uh, booked all, uh, practically all of them yourself, and I wanted to thank you for that as well. I thank you so much and for we the. We got some great guests from you for as the well. opportunity. Yeah, oh, I, I, I somehow got s- some pretty good interviews out of it. Yeah, and I think I learned it from watching you, Aww. just like the drug ad <laughs> <laughs> from the nineties. Perfectly said. Yep. Jamie, you never wanted to have anything to do with this from the beginning? Nope, and I still don't. And I was reminded today when I was being yelled at by Jim Jeffries, why I hate this so much. (laughs) (laughs) Not that was not specific to you. (laughs) I know, but I you know, of course I took it personally. You can't help but take it personally when someone funny decides what you love is shit. Yeah, no, it's very difficult to separate yourself, especially when he's looking. I just kept sitting here saying to myself, like, he's just doing a bit, he's just doing a bit, he's just doing a bit. (laughs) And thankfully, you've been around comedians to know that was, in fact, what was happening. Um, But thank you very much all these uh, years. I mean, we're going to go back and take care of the cat later. But just as far as the show goes, uh, it's meant the world to me to, to have you be a part of this, honestly. Aww. Yeah. It was sweet. It was nice to me. Yeah. It's really He's always nice to me. I'm never nice to him. <laughs> That's how it works. <laughs> that is, in fact, how it works. Um, and thank uh, uh, all the, the, the listeners and viewers over the years. Um, Are I you going to name them all, too? Yep. yep. <laughs> well, take well, there's only nine of <laughs> yeah, them, so not, it's okay. I made a list. How did you know? He's not going to remember. I bet he makes a list. Um, I wanted to, uh, very special thanks. Got you, you son of a bitch. The only paper I needed tried to get away. Very special thanks, of course, to all the people you saw do the videos. Um, no reason to mention them. But dating back to the original crew, Jason Crew, Tyler Crowley, Alex Miller, Jason McIntyre, who's here up in the booth, J. Mack! <laughs> Dr. Kenny Chen, Dr. <laughs> Evil Kenny Chen here on the floor, director. I want to also thank Kenny for bringing me this lovely mug from Taiwan. It's this. It's a coffee place called Mr. Brown's Coffee, and he bought it for me because apparently their mascot looks exactly like Sala from Indiana Jones for no reason. <laughs> so, he, so he brought this for me, and I love it. Thank you, Kenny. Also here, Mike Duman, who's been helping out for the last many years. Brad Register, Ryan Noble. Past guest hosts, in addition to Sam, Dana Gould, Jay Moore, Mark Evan Jackson, Paget Brewster. Makeup artist Kate Shorter, who alleged to be here. If you are, I love you dearly. Thank you. Jennifer Zell, Angie Johnson, L. Favarul, sure, that's a name. Sonia Cabrera, Megan Williams, Samantha Ward, and Jaden Fox, who's here today. 
I also want to point out that Jane is my niece. She's almost she's about to be 21 years old, and she would come and like did a, a sign off on this show, would probably when she was like 12. And uh, there's a I don't know if there's a clip. Of, I mean, I know we don't have a clip today, but I don't know if we isolated a clip and put it on YouTube of uh, Paul Shear and Rob Hubel telling uh, like a 12 year old Jaden to do Salvia. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, she was 12 or 13. They said, how old are you? And she answered, and they said, you should do salvia. Yeah. Uh, but they went off on it for like a minutes. couple minutes. Yeah, yeah. Had. Oh, yeah. No, it was horrifying then. Horrifying. For sure. <laughs> um, interns, Adam Brooks, David Mandel, Natalie Rosen, Luke Allen, who I think is here, and Brian McCauley, who's in the house somewhere. Oh. Brian, <laughs> love you madly. For those of you who followed along, uh, best intern ever, Brian. Uh, Jeremy Shelton, who did that opening uh, uh, graphic uh, every uh, episode and put in the guest name, and it was an extraordinary thing that we never paid him a penny for, and it really was just a ridiculous gift that he gave us on a weekly basis for nine-plus years. Jeremy Scott, the original artwork. Sean Foster, original forum moderator. Glenn Goldwasser, the current website. Derek Hausman, Mark Jeffrey, Lon Harris, Will, sorry, Will Thompson, Bo Hudspeth, the theme song for the first 50 episodes. Kurt Smith of the duo Tears for Fears did our theme song for episodes 60 to 100. And we went, that's too fucking dreary, man. <laughs> and Brian Tyler, the brilliant one who did the theme song you heard far too many times here in the theater, but played like 11 different instruments on it himself and is brilliant beyond belief. And he will tell you that he played all 11 instruments and that he went... Uh, a Mensa that, graduate? That he's, yeah, that he's a Mensa graduate. Yeah. Uh, Thank he's you, honey. the vegan of musicians. Uh, and special thanks to Jason Calacanis, who was the uh, internet mini mogul jerk who I knew through poker and was visiting where he worked. And we walked in this little studio space and I said, what is this? And he said, uh, one of the employees here, Lon Harris actually, did a show called This Week in YouTube. And it was just cameras and green screen and some lights. And I'd never thought these words before and I just found myself saying out loud, and again, this is 10 years ago, I think I want to do a Charlie Rose but fun from here. And less handsy would be the comment now. Um, and unfortunately for me, he said, how soon can you start? Uh, which fucked my life for 10 years, because uh, I then had to book 400 guests or thereabouts. And um, uh, so I want a very, very special thanks to Jason Calacanis for that. I'm sure I'm leaving people out uh, too fucking bad. I'm too old to remember everyone. I agree. Right? <laughs> no, I mean yeah. about too bad. Just, it's good. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. It's good. Um, <laughs> Gideon, get our parking validated so we can go. <laughs> <laughs> Vanessa Raglan and Jamie Flan and everyone here at the Dynasty Typewriter Theater, thank you so very much for making this our last home. Greatly, greatly appreciated. And uh, until next time, and as always, well, until not next time, and as always, there is yeah, no next get time. out of my face. <laughs> Hey, uh, Kevin, uh, congratulations. Ten years, obviously, no one thought it would last that long, but it's been a great run. And uh, just a quick memory that when I found out that doing your show was an official IMDb credit, I lost my mind. I was like, obviously, there's no one over there fact-checking at IMDb, but I am thrilled this show has raised my star meter rating uh, 0.5%. So uh, congrats on 10 years, and uh, it's always good to walk away three years too late. <laughs>